What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And today we're talking about five major problems with Protestantism. <laughs> Yeah, you heard me. Five major problems that I have with Protestantism. But first, I was up late last night and I did a thing and I wanted to share that thing with you. So, drum roll, please. Merchandising. Merchandising? What's that? Merchandising. Come, I'll show you. Open up this door. <laughs> <laughs> Come, walk this way, take a look. We put the picture's name on everything. Merchandising, merchandising, where the real money from the movie is made. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I'm waiting to get my own. I want to wear it during the episodes. If you want one, that's awesome. Go grab one. I've done what I could for the prices so that I don't get too much from them so that the prices can be reasonable for you. So definitely, there'll be a link in the description below. Check those out if you want one. And if you like the content that you're seeing, be sure to like the video if you like it. Be sure to leave a comment. That helps the YouTube algorithm. And I love talking to you guys. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell because Ryan's... Well, Ryan's got a family, and Ryan doesn't always have the time to upload regularly, so you're definitely going to want to be notified. So let's get to the five major problems with Protestantism. And I know what you're thinking. You're a Lutheran, Ryan. You started the whole thing. Luther did it. You know, the whole... On the, the church door in Germany. Try to say church in Germany at the same time. It almost comes out like tongues of angels, doesn't it? Luther started the Protestant Reformation. Well... <clears throat> That's going to be a different video, so I'm going to leave it real short. No, he didn't. Luther started the Lutheran Reformation to reform the church back into what she had always been, according to the teachings of Scripture and the traditions of the ancient church fathers. The Protestant piggybackers, we'll call them, picked up on what Luther was doing, but instead of reforming the church to what she had been, they decided to make a brand new church. And if Rome did it, the Protestant reformers weren't going to do it. And the best example that I can share with you guys to find this truth is actually in the Book of Concord, in the Lutheran Confessions. Every Christian, regardless of denomination, should have this book in their home. It's available from Concordia Publishing House or Amazon.com. Grab yourself a copy. In this book, the, the doctrines of the Lutheran Church, what we believe, teach, and confess, these historical documents out of the Reformation, you will find that not only did Luther stand to correct the errors of the Roman Catholic Church, he also stood to correct the errors of the Protestant reformers who were throwing the Roman Catholic baby out with the theological bathwater. So definitely get yourself a copy of the Book of Concord. You're not going to be disappointed. <clears throat> Now, let's get to it. The five major problems with Protestantism. Problem number one, and it's the biggest problem, and it's the reason for all the others, it confuses or flat out denies the gospel. I know, but Ryan, like, we're the one true church. It's either Rome or the one true church. How can you say mainline American Protestantism confuses or even denies the gospel? Well, uh, to put the best construction on this, uh, I will say it confuses the gospel. In mainline American Protestantism, it is not justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. It is justification by grace and works together. And Jesus is in there somewhere. So you, you've ever heard the phrase, you have to say the sinner's prayer. You have to ask Jesus into your heart. You have to repent. You have to be baptized. Look, guys, the, the definition, the linguistic definition of the word gospel is good news. There's no work to be done when you hear good news. You hear the good news, you believe it, and you rejoice. To say that you have to hear the good news, make a decision for the good news, give your life over to the good news, that is a work. So you are not saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. You are saved by faith which you made a conscious decision for. And those who are dead 
in their trespasses and sins cannot make themselves alive again. That's why the Bible says he made us alive again. The gospel, the good news, the gospel being that power of salvation is that power unto salvation simply because, whereas the law demands and it is never done, the gospel proclaims believe and because of Christ, everything is accomplished already. Whereas the law demands and we can't keep it, ergo Christ had to keep it for us, the gospel simply says believe and the power of the gospel causes you to do the thing that it requires. The gospel requires you to believe and the power of the gospel unto salvation is that it causes you to believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So mainline American Protestants confuse the gospel, turn it into a work, and that doesn't help burden a conscience that is troubled by sin. And in the case of televangelists, those frauds on the Trinity Broadcasting Network that zip themselves around in private jets and take your money, they flat out deny the gospel because they tell you that you have to do absolutely everything. Jesus is just this example. He wants you to live your best life now. He wants you to be victorious. He wants you to get rid of stinking thinking. It's not Jesus died for you to forgive your sins. It's Jesus died and he wants you to be rich. That is flat out denying the gospel. He wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. That is not the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus lived the sinless life you could not in your place. And yet while he was credited with your wretchedness, he gives to you as a free gift on his account, his own righteousness. Problem number two with mainline American Protestantism It denies sola scriptura, or scripture alone. There's three major solas, major solas, that came out of the Lutheran Reformation. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura. Grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. And we're going to start with scripture alone first, because we would not have faith by grace in the Son of God who suffered and died in our place had the scriptures not revealed it to us. So Protestantism confuses scripture alone as the only source and norm for all Christian doctrine by saying scripture only. And we know that's not true. Paul encourages us to hold fast to the traditions that he has handed down. The writer uh, to Hebrews, I believe, makes reference to that faithful cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. There is an example, there is a standard, there is a tradition grounded in Scripture alone as the only source and norm for that doctrine and that tradition that is the foundation of our faith. It's not just me and my Bible. I mean, that's where Jehovah's Witnesses came from, from an at-home Bible study with no pastoral oversight, no one who was trained and versed in the scriptures and showing themselves approved to rightly discern the word of God, no one, no overseer, and they spawned off into a cult that can't predict the end of the world. That's what happens with me and my Bible Only. It is not only the Bible. It is the Bible is the only source and norm for all that is Christian doctrine. So if there is a tradition that is outside of Scripture, that tradition needs to be reformed. If there's a doctrine being proclaimed by a famous televangelist, the Scriptures call us to rebuke that televangelist and bring them to repentance for the forgiveness of their sins for it. Problem number two with Protestantism. Problem number three... And you'll see this mainly in televangelists. Protestantism, by and large, denies suffering. The Christian life is a life of suffering. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Joel Osteen is a great example of this. He wants you to be victorious. He wants every day to be a Friday. Joyce Meyer wants you to speak positivity into your life. T.D. Jakes wants you to declare things in some weird should have bought a Honda kind of language of tongues. All of these televangelists, excuse me for a minute. That was awkward. Want you to live your best life now, to live that victorious life now. There are clear promises in scripture of a blessed, happy, sin-free, joyous eternity. But those are not promised to us until the trumpet sounds, the Lord descends, and we are raised from our graves imperishable. 
Protestantism denies suffering by taking resurrection promises and making them for us today. And what does this do? It destroys faith. What life would I live watching family members die of cancer would I have if I was told I could pray that cancer away? I just had to believe on God and sow some kind of seed offering to have absolute faith in God will heal those people while well, they died. Because sometimes God says no. And the best example of this is when Paul, whatever that thorn was in his side, prayed three times for it to be removed and God's answer was no. But he didn't just say, no, I'm going to leave you to suffer. He said, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. The Christian life is a life of suffering, not just mockery and persecution, but also struggling and wrestling with sin and repentance and faith and back and forth struggling with that. It's struggling in relationships with those around us. It's struggling, toiling in, in, in the sun, uh, that curse of Adam. I think of Adam every time I have to go out and pull weeds and do my lawn. It's a life of suffering. We are not called out of this life of suffering. We endure by faith in the promise that his grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in our weakness. That's problem number three with Protestantism. Problem number four, it ignores tradition. And it's anti-credal. I'm going to caveat onto that. There is a tradition that has been handed down to us from generation to generation from that faithful cloud of witnesses, the traditions that Paul himself established and encouraged us to continue in. Mainline American Protestantism today, by and large, throws that out. We don't want that old stuffy church. We don't want to be a part of grandpa's church. We got to have a new revival. We got to breathe new life into this dying church. Basically what it does by denying tradition and seeing the intrinsic beauty of an aged woman covered in the robe of Christ's righteousness, what it does is it lathers her up like a painted lady of the night and presents her to a world like a whore. I'm sorry, that's what mainline American Protestantism does to the church. It paints up this beautiful old woman to look young, new, hip, and with the times and makes her a harlot. That's what it does. And it's anti-credal. Second to that, a part A denies tradition, part B anti-credal. We have the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and it denies these things and says, no creed but Christ. Well, that's a great creed you got there. Or it says, creed's not or deeds, not creeds. Cool. But those creeds, again, nice creed that you have there, but those creeds are the foundation, the backbone of what you believe, the faith that flows out of you towards those good deeds. It, we are grafted into a vine we cannot but help but bear fruit. But it's not us that's bearing fruit. It is the vine giving the fruit to us by that grafting into the vine. So deeds, not creeds. What a stupid creed. I mean, of course, they'll know that we are Christians by our love, but that love is founded in the tradition that of the church, the faith that has been handed down to us generation to generation by that faithful cloud of witnesses that has gone before. And we should not throw out those traditions to make the church new because they are catching on to this. When I was sitting in Wednesday night worship with my son, my oldest son, when he was being confirmed and they had the praise band worship service, he looked at me, this teenage boy, the one they were appealing to, he looked at me and said, Dad, do they think I'm stupid? Why on earth would they think you're stupid, buddy? Do they think I'm not going to like church unless it's cool? Because this is actually pretty lame. Why can't we just do it the way we do it on Sunday? At least that's authentic. Oh my gosh, I love my children. So problem number four with mainline American Protestantism, it denies the tradition, the history, the heritage that has gone before and brought the faith to the modern generation. And problem number five with mainline American Protestantism, <clears throat> it's not really Christian. It's pagan mysticism. You've heard me say it in videos before. They have replaced the authenticating markers of the church, the word proclaimed in spirit and in truth, the sacraments rightly administered. It has replaced those seemingly dead things, those vain traditions of men, with the worship of self, with the worship of emotion, with manipulating the worship service to give you that mm, feeling on Sunday. 
And you can't have a good at-home devotional unless you get that good mm, feeling. That's mysticism. That's not Christianity. Christianity is a religion of faith, not sight. But mainline American Protestantism is a religion of sight, not faith. We have to experience these things. We have to experience the divine. We can't trust that the Holy Spirit works when the word is read on a Sunday from a lectern. Mm. We can't trust that Christ is present doing his good work in baptism because we we confuse the gospel and we have to make a decision for the Lord. It's not a free gift. It's not good news. It's something we have to do. So Christ in baptism. Well, we have to get rid of that. What is this bread? What is this wine? Well, it's obviously just a symbol and we should replace the wine with grape juice because to hell with it reasons. It's not the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. The true, authenticating markers of the church, her word and her sacraments, these have been set aside for the power of emotion. And these are the five major problems with Protestantism. It confuses or denies the gospel. It refuses scripture alone as the only source and norm for all of Christian doctrine. It denies suffering. It's against the tradition that brought the faith to us today and its pagan mysticism because it's replaced the authenticating markers of the church with worship of self. Idolatry. What do you think some problems are with Protestantism? What do you think some problems are with confessional Lutheranism? What do you think are some problems with Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy? And don't tell me you're non-denominational because that's really just Baptist with a cool website. Can we at least be honest about what we are? Anyways, guys, be sure to tune in next time. Whatever that topic may be, I've got a couple of really cool ideas. One that I've been working on for a long time. I've tried like 10 rounds to get this thing right, and hopefully I'll get it off the ground. And I've got a couple other, ah, there's those tongues of angels again, a couple other cool ideas that I'm going to bring out along the way. And if you want a t-shirt, because I want a t-shirt, I'm going to buy one. Definitely check out that link in the description below. If there is something I've said that you thought was funny that you think would make a great t-shirt, let me know. I would love to get some merchandise out so you guys can rock on in 1517 film style. Until next time, may God richly bless you. The grace and the mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.